So, uh, we are greatly honored to welcome now our next speaker, Prof. Aaron Sigi, who is, a, who is director of the Department of Salmic Oncology in the Coli Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. He has special interest in ophthalmic tumors in adults and children with research interest in uval melanoma, genetics of retinoblastoma, retinal capillary meningioma, and Wolf-Hippel Dow disease. Arun has published more than 300 scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals and has edited several textbooks. He has earned also an achievement award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and he is the editor of British Journal of Ophthalmology and Clinical uh, Ophthalmic Oncology. Also, he is also a manuscript reviewer of um, at least uh, for at least 14 um, national and international journals like uh, Archives of Ophthalmology, Ophthalmology, American Journal of Ophthalmology. It's a very big honor having uh, Prof. Singhi today in our first webinar. And um, Prof. Singhi today will speak to us about everything but uval melanoma. <laughs> so, Aaron, to you. Okay, I think you should be seeing my. Thank you so much again. Uh, I think you see my slides now. Maybe you see my slides. You can see my slides now. If you can just click the full screen. Yeah, are you seeing my slides now? Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much for asking me to contribute to this uh, happy hour. So I hope I can add some happiness to this hour. I only have half an hour and you for the previous half an hour, you had an excellent presentation by Dr. Carol Shields. And she talked about melanoma <clears throat> and very briefly uh, highlighted some of the cases that mimic melanoma. So I think it's relatively straightforward, at least for us to manage melanoma but not everyone that comes with a mass in the fundus has melanoma. And the differential is actually more challenging if the lesion happens to be not so pigmented, so so-called amelanotic tumors. And that's good, that could include, of course, hemangiomas, metastasis, lymphomas, retinal tumors, hemorrhage, inflammation, different things it can mimic an intraocular mass. So over the next 30 minutes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about different cases and how we can reach a clear and correct diagnosis. Most of the, uh, I think the initial impression is driven by ophthalmoscopy and then of course supported by ancillary studies. And in rare cases, we need biopsies. So in the next 30 minutes, we have case-based presentation of eight cases and they go from easy to complex. So let's start with uh, case number one, which is a 60 year old woman with uh, happened to be noted a fundus lesion. And it's a kind of orange colored lesion. You can see it's in the inferonasal quadrant and it's circumscribed and has an orange color. And while I'm looking at it, it seems to come and go uh, as I'm seeing it. In the same day, same appointment, I see with one lens and I look the other way, I don't see it. So it keeps to come and go as we examine the patient. Obviously, uh, this isn't a hemangioma, and you can do a ICG here done several years ago. One can see prominent vortex vein, and when you press on the globe, that seems to empty out the dye. And on Doppler, it has a venous flow. So this is a varix of the vortex vein ampulla. She was sent in for treatment of hemangioma, uh, she doesn't have hemangioma. You do nothing for this and you send them away just for regular uh, periodic checkups once a year with their own doctors. So this is varics of the vortex vein ampulla. It's not that rare. Uh, you'll see it if you look for it. A uh, case number two is of a 82 year old woman, again, asymptomatic. She has a long-standing poor vision in the right eye and she goes for checkups and then she found to have this kind of a mass, uh, a temporal to the macular area. In the macular area, you see some kind of a uh, advanced uh, neovascular changes, perhaps some exudation here. Um, this looks like AMD-like appearance, some hemorrhages here. And of course, when you do an OCT, uh, you find out that it's, it's actually elevated pigment epithelium. So this happens to be a large 
a PED, a giant PED in the setting of a patient who has neovascular AMD. So normal PEDs are small, but this is big and can simulate a tumor, for example. So next one is an 89-year-old man who is in a nursing home and has a widespread prostate metastasis. Now he kind of just said, oh, I can't see well in the right eye, cannot see in the right eye. And he shows up in a clinic because they find this kind of whitish mass in the fundus. So this is the view of the fundus. You're seeing something kind of white in the lower part. And when you do a B scan, you say, yeah, I see something cystic almost, a spherical ovoid um, kind of cystic sitting uh, in front of the retina. And this seems to be, uh, to me, it looks like dislocated lens. Okay, Most of us have done cataract surgery in the past and we know what a, disloc what a dislocated lens looks like. And on the, on the B scan, you movie. can see how this moves. So this is clearly not a prostate metastasis. And if you look the slit lamp exam carefully, you find that he's aphicic. There's no lens there. So that's why the reason this is a hypermature cataract that has spontaneously dislocated. So these are kind of easy cases. That's not very difficult to figure out, but you see them uh, time to time in the clinics. So the next one is a 44-year-old Caucasian woman. She noted some flashes of light and she saw seen a mass in the eye. And the fundus is, at least the posterior pole seems to be normal, but when you look nasally, you see kind of a darkish tumor here and a better view. One can see it's like dark, a grayish black almost in color and a lot of lipid around it and subretinal fluid. You can't actually see the retina on top of it and the size is 10 by 9, and it's like 3.4 millimeters. So the appearance uh, is like chirpy, but it's certainly not flat. Chirpy is almost always flat. So this is raised tumor causing detachment and leakage. And when we look carefully from fluorescein angiogram, uh, this tumor has a retinal circulation. So choroidal melanoma is a choroidal tumor and will have a choroidal circulation. Uh, this seems to be a tumor certainly coming into the retina because it has a retinal circulation. And on further testing and evaluation, we say, well, this is not a melanoma. This is an RPE adenoma. And there are many reasons to think of that, uh, including ultrasound, et cetera. But that is kind of the diagnosis was. This is lipid, this is fluid, this is dark, a chirpy-like appearance. And we say this is RPE adenoma. Since our vision was normal, we didn't do anything. We said, well, OK. You have, uh, we'll just follow you and see what happens. And she came back about six months later and started to grow. Now, there was a clear documented growth on ultrasound. So we said, now we are kind of obligated to treat it. So we did a diagnostic FNAB transvitrally, and that showed uh, RPE cells. So just for comparison, this is the patient's sample. This is the typical choroidal melanomas, which are spindle cells, maybe spherical polygonal cells. This is more like an epithelial cell with fine pigment. So this was clearly uh, an RPE cell or RPE tumor. And now that it's growing and we have clear evidence that this is an RPE adenoma, we still had to treat it because it was growing and we treated it with plaque therapy. And you can see that after five years, our vision is still 2020. All the lipid, all the fluid is gone. And this is a regressed, partially regressed tumor. So this is an RPE adenoma biopsy proven that was showing some growth and therefore was treated with plaque radiation. So this patient does not need prognostication, does not need any kind of risk for metastasis because we know these tumors do not metastasize. So this is a dark tumor, but it's not a melanoma. So the next one is an interesting case. Uh, this is a 50-year-old Caucasian man who had some blurred vision over two weeks and the doctors, some retina doctors were going to do the drainage according to the patient's history. And then before surgery, they called another doctor to look in and he said, no, cancel the surgery and you go to the oncology clinic. So this is the appearance. You can see uh, blood vessels all around in the anterior segment. I thought that's what uh, probably alarmed them a bit. And when you do a fundus exam, one can see this multi-lobulated ciliochoroidal detachment perhaps, or maybe tumor. You don't know. So you look at the blood vessels and look at this and you start to think, could this be a ring pattern of a ciliary body melanoma with all the sentinel vessels in front of it? 
his disc and macula seems to be all right. And of course, uh, you do a B scan and you find out this isn't a tumor after all. This is just a detachment because it's clear on ultrasound. So this is a large celiocorrhodal effusion. But then why does he have these blood vessels on the surface? And that is kind of a little bit was confusing. But of course, if you think hard, you say, well, this is backed up episcopal venous pressure. And we thought he may have a fistula. And he did. We sent him to neuroradiology. They found the fistula, keratical cavernous fistula, which was treated. And after treatment, you can see as uh, the fistula, all the blood vessels, are, most of them are gone. And fundus, you can see a resolution of the celiocorrhosis detachment. So this did not require any intervention. Uh, a good diagnosis will take to the right treatment, and that's all we need to do. So coming to the last three cases, a little bit more complicated. So this is a 53-year-old woman with uh, blood vision for some time, and she has a known history of sarcoidosis several years ago. And uh, on examination, of course, there was no inflammation that we could find, but we do see a kind of ill-defined thickening in the choroid. And you say, yes, can this be a sarcoidosis? Can this be scleritis? All those are possibilities. But when we do, I did the scans and blood work, everything was negative, can't really find any other area of involvement or biopsy. Then we do a B scan, you find something inside and you find something outside. And you can tell that this is in the choroid, here is the sclera, and this is at the junction of the sclera and the optic nerve. So you do find some element of what's called extraocular extension or transcleral disease. So can this be melanoma with extraocular extension? Because it's totally kind of ill-defined, more yellow, orange in color, but more looks like lymphoma, I would thought. So anyhow, you have to do some kind of biopsy to prove where it is. And so we tried to do a transconjunctival orbitotomy to find the mass. And just to give you some anatomy, here is the sclera. Uh, here is the inferior oblique that's been retracted. The medial rectus has been taken off. And here's the tenons, and that's the fat. And this is the area of what we think is the lymphoma. And this was biopsy. And I will show you screenshots from, this, from the surgical video. So this is the area we're going after. This is clearly the area of extraocular extension, and you know where that is, just near the optic nerve. So there will be some bleeding, uh, and you could control it with pressure and thrombin, and not much will happen to such cases. They come on good. So biopsy confirmed it was a lymphoma, EMZL, external marginal zone lymphoma, did low-dose radiation, and this is after radiation. The choroidal mass is gone. Uh, this is the OCT before and after. It's normalized and with normal visual acuity. So when you're looking at the uveal lymphoma, and we don't have time to talk about lymphomas in detail, but just to know that there are two kinds, and uveal and vitreoretinal, and uveal lymphoma is more like an ethnexal lymphoma, and they are treated that way and managed accordingly. So it's very different from the primary CNS lymphoma, which is the vitreoretinal lymphoma. So this is you know, the next case. Another interesting, challenging case is of a 74-year-old woman, blood vision in the left eye, no prior history of cancer, and she comes with something like this. So you can see here a yellowish tumor around the nerve, pressing on the nerve, and you can see there's multifocal. So it's, a, of course, not melanoma. I would say the highly and number one diagnosis would be metastasis. So you work the patient up, um, and you'll find most likely, if they have no prior history, the lung is the primary source. Lung was biopsied, and they found it was a you know no carcinoma in the lung. And then she received treatment, and she did well. It's unusual to see metastasis of the iris and ciliary body, but here the thought was interesting. You see a uh, and a kind of a nodular vascular nodule <clears throat> with some anterior segment inflammation. And this looks like kidney shaped, right? And it was coming from kidney, I thought was interesting. So renal carcinoma, uh, biopsy proven, and then was treated with plaque and, and intracameral avastin and did very well. So the treatment of metastasis, of course, is variable. Uh, most commonly, we say nowadays, use of chemotherapy, immune therapy, hormonal therapy, targeted therapy based upon the source or the mutations, external radiation, if it's diffuse disease or if it's pressing on the optic nerve or there's a lot of detachment. And don't forget 
in some cases, when they're totally advanced, it's easy. They may require no treatment. You can just leave them alone because their outcome, survival outcome is very poor. But before you decide anything, you really want to call the oncologist and work with them to see what's the optimal treatment that you can offer this patient who may have limited survival. So come taking me to the last case. This is kind of a case from which I learned a lot. He's a 47-year-old engineer from Cleveland who I presented with blurred vision for six months, nothing in the past history, and vision is 2050. And you can see here on the slit lamp examination, this is a retro lentil mass. So this is a slit lamp exam. Here the lens is clear, and right behind the lens, you see kind of ciliary body hanging down. That's kind of what you're seeing. And fundus photograph is difficult to image, but you can see kind of a large mass up there. And we did a B scan on him, and we can find it's a kind of large mass, 16 by 16 in base, 12 millimeters in height, acoustically hollow. And when we did the B scan, or sorry, A scan, it has a medium reflectivity and does not have sound attenuation. Normally, we would expect the waves to kind of go down, but the waves are all staying horizontal. So this is not typical of melanoma. This pattern is not typical of melanoma. This is compatible with melanoma but not really diagnostic of melanoma. And we know this because we have a big book on the topic, but in any case, we realize that this is not a clear-cut melanoma. Maybe it's metastasis, maybe something else. And it's important because if it's melanoma, it's large size, the treatment would be nucleation. If it's met, it would be radiation perhaps, and if it's something else, then it's something else. So the easiest way to work up a patient is to do non-invasive imaging. We did CT scan, chest, abdomen, pelvis. Didn't find anything. It's unusual to have metastasis without primary. We know some metastasis may happen in absence of primary. That's only 1%. So 99%, you will have a detectable tumor, but we don't find any. So we say, well, okay, then maybe we should do a diagnostic final aspiration biopsy because there's nothing here to say it's clearly melanoma and we want to know what it is. And so we did a transscleral diagnostic, fine needle aspiration biopsy, and was negative. When I say negative, nothing, no cells, no blood, not even pigment, not even lymphocytes, nothing at all. It was just like blank. And we were surprised. We have done hundreds and hundreds of uh, biopsies for melanoma, and we say that at least you get some blood, if nothing else, uh, in cases of melanoma. So this biopsy is also not typical of melanoma, and we know this because we have a bunch of experience and we also put that in a, in a book. So we said now, it's all the more reason that findings are not concordant. The B scan is not concordant with diagnosis of melanoma and so is the FNAB, even though it's not diagnostic. So we say now we are gonna do an incisional biopsy, which is rare for us to do for, for melanoma, melanomas or for any tumor for that matter. And we did that and came back as schwannoma. So now you have a case of uval schwannoma, and you can enucleate this eye, you can radiate this eye, or you can excise it, or you can even observe it. But if you observe it, you are setting up this eye for perhaps a neovascular glaucoma because the tumor will grow slowly over many years, and radiation really doesn't work for schwannoma. So you really have an option of either enucleating or excising or sit there till you till it takes you to enucleation. So we thought maybe we'll attempt this case and try to excise it. So here's a short video. We take off the superior rectus muscle, do a, a scleral flap. You'll see that uh, being done. Blue dots are the outlines of the tumor as best we can judge by transillumination and with indirect. You start to see the tumor here. And the tumor seems to be in the supraciliary 
region is not adherent to sclera and it's not adherent to the uvea. It's kind of between the two, almost like a filling of a sandwich and you see this big tumor. UVA is all normal at the under it. And as you continue slowly, and you'll see here a fine attachment. I think that's the anterior ciliary nerve from which the tumor is arising. You'll see it um, when we're inside. We'll be transect that nerve in a minute, a few moments. So here is the nerve, you see a little thin strand. Yeah, here, that's the nerve right there. Hmm? And we just we cauterize it and cut it, and then we close it and move on. So it was schwannoma. Confirmed by electron microscopy, also immunohistochemistry was clearly schwannoma. This is what he looked like three months later. Good vision, and this is almost five years later, he still had 2020 vision. I think it's a great outcome for a case like this. So coming back to, to when you're looking at the masses, it's not always melanoma. In real world, other things are more common. We didn't talk about hemangioma so much, or Albert did talk about RPE tumors, and simulating conditions. Thank you so much, Maria, for inviting me and asking me to contribute to Happy Hour. It's a great privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Arun. Great lecture. Um, I've got a question for you. Um, so what's your thoughts about the safety and efficacy, efficacy of uh, FNB, fine, uh, meaning fine needle aspiration biopsy? So fine needle aspiration biopsy, we say it's 25 gauge. People sometimes use 27, and some people even use 30 gauge needle. So uh, there's a broad experience for almost for the last 30 years now. And overall, we say that the risk, two main things are really uh, hemorrhage and, and detachment. Hemorrhage risk, anytime you put a needle into the tumor, you will get a hemorrhage, but almost always, hemorrhage is minimal and transient and will go away. We have only one, one out of 100 cases, so 1%, but the hemorrhage is visually significant where you need a vitrectomy or some other intervention to remove the blood. But otherwise, it's uh, it's rare. So it's a small hemorrhages will happen and will go away. A detachment also approximately the same rate, so 1% to 2%. Uh, and that, that doesn't really happen at the site of the biopsy because the tumor itself is like a like a buckle, it's an indent, right? So it's, it's, it's helping the detached retina right there. It's the traction from the vitreous and at the base, et cetera, you can get a tear. So those are rare. So we say 1% complication rate of hemorrhage, significant hemorrhage or uh, retinal detachment, yeah. Other than that, you don't really get much complications, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Aaron, for being with us today. It's a very big honor for us. Thank you very much. Maria, good luck with your endeavor of starting this oncology service. Like Carol said, it will happen. It's a matter of time. And I'm sure it's, it's, this is a good beginning. And uh, congratulations to you. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank you. So now 